they hang them up, they kill them, they stick their hand down into their body cavities and rip out their organs. Hi, it's Emily from Bite Size Vegan, and welcome to another Vegan Nugget. I had the honor of speaking in two classes at Passaic Valley Regional High School in New Jersey. I was invited to spend some time with a passionate vegan student, Alyssa. That's her. Hi, um, I'm Alyssa. I was the one who contacted you to set up the conference. And her attentive peers, who listened to me ramble on quite a bit about all manner of animal rights and vegan topics. This was part of a unique class called Contemporary Issues Through Video Conferencing, run by Ms. Kathleen Minicky. The class invites guest speakers to, to utilize technology to create an interactive classroom and speak with individuals in diverse fields all over the world. So I wanted to share with you guys a segment from one of the classes. I apologize for the rapid speaking in this. I was really excited to try to fit in as many nuggets as possible in these 45-minute classes. Captions are available for your convenience. And as always, for more information, please see the description below and the blog post. Now it's time to go back to high school, where I was always the cool kid. I just want to know if you can explain a little bit um, the relationship that our government, or just governments in general, have with the agricultural and the factory farming and dairy industries kind of the money that might be exchanged or the power within and kind of things like that. Okay, I would love to talk about that. Uh, I mean, the government, especially in America, but I think in, in other countries that I've looked into as well, the regulatory bodies that are supposed to like, regulate animal agriculture, so in America we have the USDA, also have a vested interest that like, the USDA also benefits from more animal products being sold. So they're self-regulating. Um, what we do in America, they stopped doing this in Europe, but in America for chickens, once we've killed them and everything, taken off their feathers and everything. We soak the carcasses in these things called like, they're like tanks, they just pop these things, pop them into this water that uh, this one industry specialist calls fecal soup because the chickens, you know, they've still got a lot of their feces and they weren't flushed out well because they're supposed to, what they do is they usually hang them up, they kill them, they stick their hand down into their body cavities and rip out the organs and everything. They're supposed to flush them out, flush out all the poop and everything. Doesn't always work that way because we've also like assembly line like faster and faster, which is how workers lose arms and everything. So by the time they get to the, the water, they still have, you know, fecal matter and stuff on them. But, you know, chicken producers, they get paid per weight most of the time. And so the heavier the bird is, the better. So it's actually, they'll actually even inject them with more water or let them sit there and kind of... So it's like, yeah, you've got more chicken. It's just, it's kind of bloated with some, some poop water for you. So, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of astounding. But the USDA is like, uh, sorry, you know, a certain level of fecal matter is okay, just cook it. One of the more recent speeches that I did was in Dublin, Ireland. Ireland is kind of, you know, when people talk about free range, grass fed, small farms, Ireland is the embodiment of that. You know, there's like an entire country that does it that way. So all of the uh, dairy cattle there, they're very big on dairy. All the dairy cattle are grass fed. They're out in the beautiful Irish fields. What they don't talk about, though, they do have like industrial uh, pig farming and chicken farming. But what I did in that speech, and, what, and I'm going to be tying this in to what you asked in a second, is I was like, okay, let's, one thing I like to do is like, there's, there's like so many horror stories that I can show people. I can show graphic abuse of animals that like even meat eaters are like, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this to them. Sometimes I can shock people into to waking up, but I think it also leaves this door for like, well, we just need to treat them better. So what I think is more effective is to say, okay, let's look at the ideal. Let's look at what we as a society or as a country have said, this is acceptable. So we look at the ideal and even that, is not even acceptable to us, then it might be time to change. One of the things I've done very often in a lot of my research, especially going to Portugal and Ireland, but in America as well, is I look at the legislation. And sometimes it takes, I mean, it took months and months of digging into the EU legislation because I'm yet to find a country that makes it really easy to find everything. <laughs> For one thing in America, I think one thing that people don't always realize is that we have no federal law protecting the treatment of farmed animals. There's nothing, there's no regulation as to like how they should be treated federally. There's also something called common farming exemptions, which basically means if something's done enough across industry, like if, if enough people do this, even if it's awful, we're going to call it standard practice and it's okay. One thing that I found that I find really telling too is so in this Ireland speech, I was going way, way deep into the legislation because the EU has some of what's lauded as like the most, that like they have the widest range protection for animals. They have great, you know, legislation because in this thing called the Treaty of Lisbon, the EU basically was the first uh, governmental kind of body 
to legally say that animals are sentient. So this is actually in their legislation, animals are sentient. So what they decided from that, okay, now that they're sentient and we've acknowledged that they can feel these emotions and they can hurt, it didn't, it's like the conclusion wasn't, okay, now maybe we shouldn't kill them. No, now we're going to make sure that we design the, the right ways to kill them. So then they launched, you know, these different studies and everything to like try to figure out what, how do we kill them? And then they drafted this thing called the Protection for Animals at the Time of Killing, which sounds absurd. And if you really look in there, so one of the things is I like to talk about is the chicks, the male chicks in the, in the egg industry. In like the egg industry, the, the chickens who are laying eggs for human consumption, males can't do that. And the way that we've specialized things, we have layer hens and then we have broiler chickens. And so the ones, the chickens that you eat are different than the chickens who have eggs. So the male chickens of like the egg industry, there's no, there's no use for them. So then the industry, the egg industry is the world over, no matter how big or little, have to figure out what do we do with all these baby, male baby chicks. So in every country, they're killed. I mean, there's nothing else to do with them. And it's either through gassing them, suffocating them, or grinding them alive. Grinding seems to be the preferred thing. In the EU legislation, this landmark stuff that you hear in the news, like maceration is how to kill chicks. Throw them in a grinder. America too is the standard here. Ireland's the standard. And the reason that they did this, I dug deep enough to find what's called the impact assessment, where they're deciding how we're going to kill these animals. And of course, the people on the panel are the egg industry, the dairy industry, a company called Butina, which I'll talk about in a second. And they have in there, okay, if we gas the chicks, it's going to cost this many euros, and that's, that's expensive. If we grind them up, studies have showed it's a negligible cost, it's pretty cheap. So what do they put in the humane legislation? Grind them up, grind up the baby boys. And, you know, there's actually now a number of companies trying to research a way to sex the eggs before they're hatched so we can determine which ones are going to be boys, and then we'll just throw those eggs away so they don't hatch and we don't have to kill them. Because the legislation usually says, if there is, even is any, that they have to be killed within the first three days of life. Now it's like, you know, we're going to spend years and, you know, probably at the end, like at least a billion dollars trying to figure out how to tell if it's a baby boy so when it hatches we don't have to kill him. And it's kind of like we step back from it. It's like maybe, maybe we just shouldn't eat the eggs. Maybe. I've yet to meet a person who eats eggs that would wake up in the morning, take a, a little fluffy yellow chick, throw them in a blender and blend them up for breakfast. That's horrifying. But it's like when we eat eggs, that's what's happening. We just don't see it, and we don't want to connect to it. But there's no way to have eggs without that happening, because there's nothing. The baby boys, they're, they're waste. They're just waste material. They assume it's like something like 3.2 billion baby chicks are killed worldwide every year. So, I mean, like, when we look at this kinds of legislation, it's like, this is our, this is our ideal. This is, like, the, the humane ideal of how, of how to treat, you know, these animals. In the dairy industry, baby boys there are also waste material, because... Dairy cows produce milk. Boys aren't going to produce milk. A mother cow like, has a baby. If he's a boy, he's either taken to the veal industry, which a lot of people, even meat eaters sometimes, are like, I'm not going to do veal. That's just cruel. So he's like shuttled either to the veal industry where he's like, you know, tied up, can't move and anything, and then slaughtered when he's a couple days old. Or sometimes they just shoot him in the head or they'll bludgeon him. They'll just beat him, beat him in the head, hope that they're going to die at some point. They don't really check on him. So it's like, it's, I mean, they're waste. They're waste material. Veal is like, you know, they're the ideal. It's like, oh, well, at least we can make a prop. Someone can make a profit from this baby. And like in the pig industry, you know, in America too, it's like, it's another humane thing. If you look in the EU too, one of the ways to kill piglets that are either, um, you know, deformed or they're a runt or like they're sick and they're too sick. It doesn't make financial, there's no financial reason or gain. It's too expensive to fix them. It's something called blunt force. So what they do is they pick up the baby pigs by the, by the legs and they smack their heads on the concrete. And that's, that's the human, that's a humane approved thing. So in America, we had this, you know, expose happen of undercover footage. And a lot of the news articles said things like, you know, workers were, were filmed uh, beating baby pigs against the pavement and they were still twitching, you know, because there were undercover people there and they like would document how long it took these piglets to die. But the things that the news articles in will tell you, because you'll also find news articles about like undercover footage showed baby chicks being thrown in a grinder. And it's salacious and everyone goes, oh my gosh, this is horrible. We have to stop this. But then they keep eating eggs and they keep eating bacon and they keep eating pork and they keep drinking milk. Because what, what, the connection that's not made is like, this isn't, this isn't undercover abuse. This is standard industry practice. You know, it's just like, it's not something that the articles usually cover. So it's like, I mean, I think we get this impression that like, well, that's one, that's just one place where these people were doing this horrible thing. No, that's, there's nothing illegal about that. And in that expose of these, of this pig place, the workers were also um, abusing mother pigs because it was a pig breeding facility. So they were, you know, beating the pregnant pigs, jamming like rods into their orifices, just horrible stuff. And one of the leading humane uh, specialists in, a, in the country is uh, Temple Grandin. You ever heard of her? And so she commented on one of these articles and she was like, this is outrageous abuse. 
but she's talking about the mother pigs, and she's like, because they, they, they say something about the baby pigs, she's like, oh, that's standard practice, it's fine, but what they're doing to the mothers, horrible. And so in one of my recent videos, I list, like, all of these offenses, or all of these things that are, were seen in this undercover investigation, like from the, the baby pigs and the mother pigs, and if you didn't know the laws and you looked at these two, I think, I don't know if anyone would be able to be like, this one's okay, this one's not, this one's okay, this one's not. Oh, ripping out the baby boy's testicles with no anesthetic? Oh, it's totally fine, you know, because that's what happens. You cut off their tails, you clip their teeth, you pull out their testicles. No anesthetic is required at all. And I think if people don't know the law, it's like assume that that's some sort of abuse that's going to be corrected. But it's not. It's completely legal. And it, it's just one of the things that, you know, in this EU uh, document as well, they have they talk about the CO2 chambers, and that's Butina, the company I was telling you about. It's kind of like the, the, the way to kill pigs these days. It's kind of seen as like the most humane way. And so pigs are kind of lowered into this CO2 chamber. And, and the biggest ones, it's almost like a giant rotisserie. They go in there and they get lowered. And it basically, like, they burn from the inside out. And they scream. I've been to these places. Like, I've been to one in uh, Manchester in, in the UK. The walls were thin enough. You could hear the churning. You could hear the workers slapping the pigs. You could hear them screaming for blocks, you know. And they, they're, it's terrifying when they scream. So it is not, a, it's not a, a calm death. It's not a friendly death. It's not a humane death. You know, there's no, there's no such thing. But you know, this is what we look at. It's like, okay, well, the gas is like, it's the most humane thing. And it's, it's anything but. On that impact assessment, of course, there's Butina. Hey, we we're here. We're going to help figure out what's the best way to kill these pigs. And also, if you buy a lot of these chambers, we'll make a crap ton of money. But don't worry, we're not biased. So in the legislation, CO2 chambers are the thing. But there is something in the legislation that's like, we're going to reconsider this at some point. This and electric baths for killing chickens. We're going to reconsider that. But the impact assessment deemed that it's not financially viable to do right now. The laws that we have, even at the ideal, even if we don't look at a, at a abuse, the laws that our governments have, the regulations that we have, it's pretty horrifying. There's no way to make dairy without taking baby boys from their mothers, and even the baby girls get taken immediately after birth. They're shuttled elsewhere, and then they can grow up and be a big milk machine, too. And dairy cows can live 20, 25 years. In the dairy industry, they usually give out, and they become what we call downers around four to five years old because they are just serially impregnated again and again and again. Um, and so as soon as they've had a baby, artificial insemination again, um, they get another round. And then every time their babies are taken from them. And uh, I have a friend who used to be a cattle farmer. And she or she married a cattle farmer, multi-generational cattle farmer. And she just, uh, there was one too many times where they take the babies away. And the mothers are chasing the trailer as their babies leave. And then they cry for day. I mean, they, they just cry out for their babies until they go hoarse and they can't cry anymore. And she's like, I just can't, can't do this. I can't do this anymore. There's an article I found from Massachusetts where there was a dairy, like Sunshine Dairy Farm, a little farm there. Neighbors were calling the police because the cows would not stop screaming out. And the police issued a report that, okay, we talked to the farmers. Don't worry. The cows are fine. It's just a normal part of the dairy industry because they're just, they're, they're upset that their babies were taken. <laughs> Don't worry. It's fine. It's okay. They're fine. Even when we acknowledge the fact that they're grieving the loss of their children, it's like, oh, but because it's standard practice, it's okay. So it's, it's just really interesting. Like the, we have such a divide in our minds. Like pigs, pigs have mannerisms very much like dogs. And we would never do the things to pigs that we do to dogs. And even Americans get super outraged about the Yulin Dog Festival. And you know, people in that country are eating dogs, that's not cool. And I've never would I say that is, but if if who we can eat and who we can't eat is determined by where we're living, that kind of gives evidence that this isn't a logical based decision of ours. I just want to thank you again so much yeah. for talking with us today. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. We deem them legally sentient. Yet we have the audacity to hold this legislative recognition of non-human sentience on high as a giant step forward for the rights of animals. As if systematically exploiting individuals with fully admitted knowledge and comprehension of their capacity to suffer is something to commend. And look what we offer ourselves as evidence of progress. One news report extolled the reduction in animals slipping and falling on their way to slaughter in one abattoir in one country. When we look at our actions from the other side, the perversity and the absurdity of our deluded self-congratulations is astounding. If you were in the place of these beings, how grateful would you feel to your captor if they laid down a bath mat on the ramp to your execution?